Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living in the Heart of Las Cruces. It's March. That's got to be a good thing. <clears throat> uh, we're going to start with a couple of songs. And um, I'm Sarah Benson, and, and Doug is still not feeling well, so I need you guys to sing extra loud. So <laughs> thanks. Um, I invite you to stand if you'd like. And yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. do it a few times so do your best to pick it up it's really beautiful I yeah, do too. I think it's very beautiful. nice. <laughs> good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. Feels like I've been gone way longer than two weeks. <laughs> and life continued. All is good, it looks like here. 
I do have some sad news to report that Patty Taylor passed away Thursday. Um, so Deb is gratefully receiving our condolences and whatever all else. She said that she wants to have a tea party in her mom's memory, so she'll get us more information on that. She thought that'd be the perfect way to memorialize her mom. So we'll let you know once we have a date set for that. And along those lines, I might as well give you the other memorials as well. Jerry Lund, uh, Terry Lund, Reverend Terry Lund's husband, his memorial will be March 23rd here at 3.30. And Reverend Bonnie Allen Rice will have her memorial celebration of life May 11th here at 3 o'clock. So we've got three of them coming down the pike. Yeah. Huh. So welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living here in the heart of Las Cruces, where our vision is a world and loving partnership for the good of all. And that was our theme at the conference. People talked about how we might make that so, what actions we need to take. So there'll be more about that next week when I'm speaking. Uh, I want to welcome anyone visiting for the first time, and hopefully you've got a visitor's packet, and there's a gift certificate to the bookstore in there. So check out the bookstore. And we have a newsletter, so hopefully you read the newsletter. There's so much going on here. I'm going to try and get through it quickly, <laughs> but read the newsletter for all the information. Check out the table in the social hall for sign-up and additional information. So we still have Ed Breeding's events going on on the 8th here at 6 o'clock p.m. He's going to be showing Genus Sky, A Journey into the Heavens. It's a documentary about a local photographer, Michael Gutierrez, as he captures photos of the majestic New Mexico skies. And he'll be talking about uh, how he did the artwork and, the, and all of that. And then we also have his artwork in the social hall and some of Bonnie Allen Rice's. What's on the wall of Bonnie Allen Rice's is art that she owned as well as did. So some of it is not her work, but it's artwork that's for sale. And we also still have her Ford Focus for sale. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, see Bob or myself after the service. <clears throat> she left the car to us, which we are grateful for. Our next certified class will be Mystical Path, which replaced Practical Mysticism. So it's a different take. It's a different book that we'll be reading, but it's about the mystical path. And it offers students a journey into oneness. This course provides an opportunity to study the perspective of a mystic to expand our awareness of the divine presence in life. And so hopefully if you're interested, we start that this Thursday from 1 to 4. It's only seven weeks, not eight weeks, seven weeks long. So sign up if you're interested. We'll be meeting here um, on Thursdays from 1 to 4. And then next Sunday is daylight savings time. Don't forget. <laughs> we spring ahead. So that's the t I, for me, that's the more difficult one. Um, and we will have our board meeting after the service. And we will begin collecting our next treasure sale items the following Sunday on the 18th, and the sale will be April 20th. We have a lot of things from Bonnie Allen Rice's estate that will be in the yard sale, but please continue to add to it, and we will have a fabulous sale that day. And then, let's see, March 17th, we will also do a new member orientation. There's a, uh, at least one person that's interested in joining us. So if you're interested and you're not a member, we'll do a new member orientation that Sunday. And then looking into May, we have a weekend with Yolanda Martinez coming up. Some of you might remember her from before. She's a Native American woman who does drum making workshops. She's going to do a drum making workshop after we see an Ed Breeding documentary about her on Friday evening, May 3rd. On the 4th will be the workshop. Sunday, she wants to do the music with us here, drumming. <laughs> and then after the service, she calls it a drum birthing workshop where people can bring their drums and the ones that made new ones will birth their drums into that uh, service or that uh, workshop after. So a lot going on that weekend if you're interested, but the reason I'm telling you now is we need the people to register by April 15th for the workshop to fly. So if you're interested, please let her know. The information's out there or in the newsletter and um, get registered. Otherwise, it won't happen. So we're seeing it happen, but we gotta have registrations by April 15th. And I did all that. We're good. Please welcome our practitioner to the platform, Judy Hunt. 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, underneath all those activities is our belief in the power of prayer. That's really what, what powers us here. And we have, you have prayer requests on the chairs in front of you. So if there's anything uh, weighing on your heart, um, something happening in your family, please fill that out. And a wonderful group of people gather every week from the four new thought centers here in Las Cruces, and we pray with you on those. And also available, um, the people in Blue Stoles, me and Bob, are available for anything that you're carrying this, this, this morning, and we can just pray that away and have an awesome Sunday where you can feel the truth of the love that is in you. So we'll be available after service if, if you'd like. There are also gratitude cards because, of course, with prayer comes resolution. So we love to hear about how prayer is working in your life and how things are changing. I personally have had people selling their homes, finding jobs, Stuff is great, so use us, we, it works. And now it's time for song, silence, and prayer. Now I let myself We know that every moment is a new beginning. That what happened, happened, and now it's a new moment, a new breath, and we relax and let that newness that is filled with freshness, the love of spirit, the peace, the harmony, all of that flowing in this new moment. We celebrate we give our love and gratitude everywhere we go, and we see that it is all good. And so it is. Our reading today is a little short beauty. Uh, I, it's from Ernest Holmes' Thoughts Are Things. I just love it. There is a peace at the center of your being a peace that can be felt through the day and in the cool of the evening when you have turned from your labor and the first star shines in the soft light of the sky. It broods over the earth quietly, tenderly, as a mother watches over her child. And so it is. All right, I'm going to do amazing things. 
since we're starting a month of new stuff, talking about doing things new ways. Um, I noticed that both of the, the specials I chose today talk about change, but in, in a, uh, they're, they're coming from a place of rest uh, rather than a place of effort. So maybe that's where I am at this <laughs> point in my life, I hope so, and I usually do this song with Doug, so I hope I, I know half of it really well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for trying to do that on your own, and you did a fabulous job. Thanks. And you know, our topic for the month, which fits in with this, is that's how we've never done it before. <laughs> okay. There it is. That, that's a little too. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what we're looking at as we move into March. And today we are starting the month off with one of our favorites, Reverend Bram Watkins, who is a native to New Mexico and was raised in La Union, New Mexico, and El Paso, Texas. He has an MBA from the American Graduate School of International Management in Phoenix, Arizona, a BA in Spanish from the University of New Mexico, a Master Practitioner degree in Neuro Linguistic Programming from NLP Learning Systems in Dallas, Texas, and is an ordained interfaith minister by One Spirit Interfaith Seminary in New York, New York. He is a student of Science of Mind, Unity Teachings, and Pranic Healing. He has served as a guest speaker over the last 17 years in local churches here and in El Paso. For his complete bio, that wasn't all of it, see the new 
newsletter. <laughs> we are so grateful to welcome him back to our platform. Welcome, Reverend Bram Watkins. <laughs> We, we've got to do an update. Next month makes 20 years. <clears throat> 20 years I've been doing this. Oh, love that. Uh, Sarah, love that new song. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. How may I serve? How may I serve? That's uh, for a redheaded Leo with anger issues. That's always a good thing to try to remember. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get this thing to balance. I'm so happy that I don't have to use paper anymore. I can use this iPad. So as I was driving up today from El Paso, it is absolutely gorgeous outside. Just made me think, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I just love that, especially before the wind starts this afternoon, <laughs> which is why I was telling some folks earlier, I just one of the good things maybe about COVID is I learned that this helps stop allergies as well. So um, March and April, that's what I kind of carry around. So um, I, the last time I spoke here was in December, and the, uh, the monthly theme was living wholeness, and I had no idea what that meant, much less what in the world is, um, what are we talking about? That's how we've never done it. Does anybody know what that means? <laughs> and when you go first, that only adds to it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Um, so what I normally do is I'll grab the Science of Mind magazine, I get it in print, and I get it digitally, and I'll just start reading through, and you know I get a pretty good idea of what's going on. We haven't printed the one for March, April yet, as you all know. But Thursday afternoon late, I kept checking, it finally popped up on my computer, and so, okay, thank goodness, thank goodness. So that's how we've never done it. What does that mean? Does that mean we've never done it that way? What if we take out never? that's how we've done it? Well, if that's how we've done it, have we always done it that way? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't, I don't know. If we've always done it that way and we've been, we've been getting good results, then that's, that's probably okay that we do it that way. But what if we've lulled ourselves to sleep and think that we're getting good results, but we're actually not? Then maybe doing things the same way over and over is, is not a good thing. So what's right? What makes sense? Does thinking about things, doing things the same way all the time make sense? Well, I, I think it depends on what kind of results are you getting day to day, year to year. But what if we bring never back into the equation? If we've never done something in a certain way, why, why is that? Is it because we don't have a reference point? I mean, often we don't know what we don't know. Or is it something more sinister? <laughs> we've never done it that way because we don't want to. Either we don't know how or we're afraid to try. That's usually my deal. Don't want to make mistakes. Afraid to try. What are we resisting and why are we resisting it? I, I found a quote that says, if you're saying something is not possible, you're saying I don't want it. And I thought that was, that was interesting as well. Are we comfortable or have we risen to a point that we're actually stagnant in what we're doing. You know, we've all heard that doing things the same way over and over again and expecting different results is a definition of insanity. So how do we reframe this? How do we change our perspective? You know, some people, <laughs> some people would rather have the mindset of better the hell they know than the heaven they don't. Fear is, of change is a very real issue for many, if not most of us, at some level. You know, my mom likes to change things up every once in a while and paint something different or move the furniture around. And my dad was always, he would always protest, absolutely not, leave it where it is. <laughs> my mom, being the smarter of the two, would just wait till my dad would go on a hunting or fishing trip for a few days and he would return and magically there would be this <laughs> new furniture moved around or things would be painted or things would be reoriented. And, you know, he was a smart man as well. He learned to live with it. <laughs> and, and figured out that he liked it. So when I first read the, uh, the theme for the month, that's how we've never done it, I immediately went to the office and I thought, well, that's how we've always done it. That's the first thing I thought of. And I've heard that many, many times back in my television career when I was running TV stations. You know, people get stuck in their ways and, and they don't like to change. I remember I was working for Univision in, in San Antonio and they promoted me and they moved me to Fresno, California. And I was going to be the general sales manager, but I was replacing four people. 
the general sales manager, the national sales manager, the local sales manager, and the research director. And so it, it you know, this, it, was, it was pretty challenging. And I was younger than every single person that I was there to manage or lead. So while I didn't have all the experience that some of them had, I knew that I could apply what I had learned. I knew that I could work harder and work longer than, than any of them. I, I, I was focused. And, you know, and at first I met a lot of resistance because people, uh, including me, we don't like change. But one of the things that I brought from San Antonio to Fresno was a, um, a sales system that our sales manager in, in San Antonio had purchased. And it was this long, it was a very detailed system for our account executives to, to use and be successful in sales. And so I made sure I brought that along. So from July of 1992, when I arrived in Fresno, until the 1st of April of 1993, I worked 12 to 16 hours a day, six days a week for those nine, nine and a half months, kind of priming the well, if you will. And we were the most successful station for Univision in 1993. Our sales literally went through the roof, extremely, extremely successful. We empowered the salespeople. Um, we celebrated our victories. We had a lot of fun. We did a lot of right things, but we also used that sales training system to the nth degree. And I've trained hundreds and hundreds of salespeople over my career now, and I have never, ever, ever had to fire a salesperson for not meeting their monthly budget, but I've had to invite a few of them to find their passion elsewhere if they did not follow that system. Again, not my system, but one that I was taught that is just absolutely amazing. I mean, it's talk about paint by numbers. If you'll just do this, you'll be successful. So seeing resistance to change at an early stage in my career helped me uh, tremendously. Um, when a new company purchased KDBC in El Paso back in 2003 and I became their new general manager, there were 67 employees. And within that first year, I had to invite 35 of them to find their life's purpose somewhere else. <laughs> Over half. Um, <laughs> I dealt with, well, we've always done it that way, so that's not my job. And if you want a real quick self-fulfilling prophecy, tell me it's not my job. <laughs> but you know, to, 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 to be fair to those folks, they had not been treated well. The previous ownership did not take care of the facilities, did not empower the people. They, they were not taken care of, and you, you develop bad habits after that. And that we were in there to, to change that and clean that up and do things. And even with the right intent, a lot of people didn't like it. I had people working against me out of fear, spite, and downright hatred. You know, it was one of the most difficult years that I had ever encountered at that point in my life. They were not happy... Um, that there was new ownership. There was, they weren't happy that there was new leadership there. Um, but that year was so difficult, it brought me closer to source. It brought, brought me closer to spirit because rebuilding a facility, a station, every department, engineering, news, sales, marketing, everything, from I, I, was, uh, I was overwhelmed. And at that point, I just let go and let God. You know, I'm showing up. Use me. But it was, it was, it was wow. Um, there was one staff member there that had been in a position of authority and was no longer in that same position. And they were not happy. Um, <laughs> I was misled. I was lied to. I was threatened with a frivolous lawsuit. I was, uh, I think they did everything but pee in my Cheerios. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was not, it was not fun. It, it, it was very challenging. And even though I know better from a spiritual perspective, I allowed that person to get under my skin and I gave my energy away through fear. And, and uh, I, I don't like using the word, but even just hating what was going on. It takes a whole lot of energy to hate. It takes a lot more energy to hate than it does to love. This person had more vested in my failure than they had invested in the success of our business. And after listening to one of Reverend Chris Chenoweth's CDs one day, I think it was on forgiveness, it finally dawned on me that I had to forgive this person. I had to wrap them in light and love and forgive them and see, send them nothing but perfect harmony and peace. Everything that I prayed for me, I prayed for this person. I couldn't have something that I wanted for me that I wasn't willing to have for them. I had to get that straight in my mind. 
Why? <laughs> because I was miserable and I'd never done it that way before. <laughs> so, try something new. I completely accepted peace and harmony for this person as well as for myself. So one morning I got up, did my prayer work, did some additional forgiveness work, drove into the office. The next thing I know, this person comes in and asks if they can take an early retirement. <laughs> they want to spend more time with their spouse. They'll stick around and train their replacement for as long as I liked. But it was amazing. As soon as I sent them unconditional love, the resistance stopped. As soon as I sent them unconditional love, there was no more fear, and the problem ceased to exist. It was immediately solved. So it reminds me, what is really meant when we are told that we are lo to love our enemies? It means that we recognize the presence of God within everyone, including those who oppose us. Because that's how I've never done it before. When we disagree with someone, how do we react? Are we loving and kind and try to be understanding, or do we judge and condemn? I love that quote that I, I left with you all last December. Edwin Markham says, He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that enclosed him in. Love is always the answer. You know, um, as I was preparing for this message and trying to figure out whatever we've never done it that way before means, um, I, something popped in the back of my mind. I said, I know I've got a quote somewhere. So I started looking back through the last 20 years of my messages, looking for, <laughs> <laughs> looking for this quote. Thank goodness for com computers. And you all have, have heard me speak before. What do I talk about? The mess that I find myself in, whether it just happened or I made it, what I did to make it worse, hopefully what I did to finally make it better, and how I learned from that. That's all I ever talk about up here. <laughs> I was shocked when I read through, whew, I was shocked when I read through a message from April of 2008, what I was going through. I was miserable, absolutely miserable in my job. I was working for a company that I wasn't congruent with my, my, my morals, my value, my character. And um, I remember reading a long list of affirmations. It had to have been a page and a half long. Every single day I'd get into the office, I'd close the door, and I read it out loud. Now, I wasn't just saying it to myself. I, I spoke the word. I read it out loud. But I can see now, 16 years later, looking back, might have been a little too narrow. Because as I read through those, it primarily talked about you know, guiding me in a way that I could see myself still running the station or still in the TV business. It was, it was narrow in focus. It was not, well, what else could be true? And uh, here I am, use me. It's an empty slate. Um, and I, I asked myself, was I only focused on staying in the TV business, you know, which is all I'd known for 20 years? You know, so could I have had the mindset that this is all I know? This is how I've always done it. When I was going through that stuff 16 years ago, I thought it was the most challenging experience that I would ever come across. But little did I know that that would be just a pebble compared to the mountains of you know what that I would be dealing with shortly thereafter in, in my life. I can't say I've always done the same thing over and over, but I'm grateful to say I would have done things differently knowing what I know now, which means I've, I've learned something. Kind of hard-headed, but I do learn eventually. Just a couple of quick things. Remember that that message was April of 2008. In May of 2008, I watched my pickup get stole, stolen right out from in front of me, and my briefcase was in it. In July of 2008, I lost that job. I was let go because the owner of all the TV stations misappropriated their funds with their bank, and he lost all their TV stations. A lot of people lost their jobs. Y'all remember September of 2008, the market crash? Just when I lost my job, I lost half my life savings. Poof. Poof. <laughs> I've been through a debilitating illness of a spouse. I worked a year for my father without a paycheck because I had to earn my way. I went to seminary school. I went through a divorce. 
I raised two amazing kids as a single father. I learned how to date again at the age of 50 when I thought nobody would love a 50-year-old man. That was a huge fear. After 20 years of running TV stations, I had to learn how to be a roofer. Purchased my dad's company not long after that. And not long after that, I lost my dad and my general manager, who were the backbone of the business, each within two months of each other. I had multiple surgeries and completely healed and overcame a cancer's diagnosis. Married the woman of my dreams and I bought a dog. <laughs> Does that sound like a country western lyrics or something like that? I, I am a highly flawed individual and I am not perfect, but I believe I am perfect in my imperfection. I have, like, like the song, Sarah, that, that new one, I have a desire to serve. I want to make a difference. I realize now that I get better results when I tell my problems about my God instead of God about my problems. I get better results when I tell my problems about my God instead of God about my problems. I know how to focus I know now to focus on the solution and not the problem. And I know now that instead of working hard and smart, that it's easier, a whole lot easier to tap in, tune in, turn on. The universal presence, the universal mind is available to you at all times. And I know now that the answers to any question that I ever have are always within me. They're not out here. So at three o'clock this morning, long after I had written this and put this to bed. I woke up and I was just like, poof, okay, thank you. It's not that going through all that stuff that I went through. And by the way, folks, that's just life. That's just stuff. But had that pickup not been stolen, well, I had so much equity in that. The, the, the insurance company gave me money. I bought an even nicer one. And what I couldn't see in those affirmations because I'd been doing it the same way for a long time, and I only saw things a certain way, I couldn't see that I was going to be moved over and work for my dad. Yes, a whole year without a paycheck. But I could not have begun to imagine how blessed I am right now, how amazing this new career has become. And yes, I had to sacrifice a marriage so that my kids would have an amazing mom. And by the way, we're still best friends. And she loves the new Mrs. Watkins, <laughs> by the way. They may like each other more than they like me, I think, sometimes. But um, the amazing things that I, I never foresaw, but I had to be willing to let go and let God. Spiritual, effort in spirituality defeats itself. Sometimes we've got to show up and we've got to be there. As my mom says, put feet to your prayers, carry water, uh, chop wood, carry water is how she says it. But once you've done that, I, I just need to be open to the things. When I got married to this amazing woman, I never would have imagined that she and her daughter would have had to have stayed in, in Florida. I mean, I live by coastally now between the Rio Grande and Fort Lauderdale. And when I get a little sideways about having to go back and forth, and she, she does the same thing, she reminds me that we don't live in, forgive me for those of you that live there, Nebraska, North Dakota, New Jersey. I mean, my gosh, we live on the beach. You know, my life is better than I ever could have imagined, but I had to at least open up my mind. And, and maybe how we've never done it or how we've always done it, just let that resonate with you. I'm not sure where it's going to sit, but... My life is better than I ever could have imagined. And that's why when you all ask me, hey, Bram, how are you? I always say, I am blessed. blessed. That's my only answer. I am always blessed. The better it gets, the better it gets. They taught us in NLP that there are very few things that are always, always. Well, I've always done it this way. Really? Always? Every single time? Well, no, not really. Oh, okay. And there are very few things that are always never. Well, I've never done it that way. Really. Never once. Never once in your life. Well, well okay, that's just a, a figure of speech. Well, no, there are no figures of speech. Never, never, always, always. But here are my exceptions. What have I always done? 
I always keep trying. What have I never done? I never give up. Even when I don't know what to do, you eat that elephant one bite at a time, just one more step. Stay in the game. Be present. Show up. In the Science of My magazine this month, which I was finally able to read <laughs> digitally, Kelly Robbins has an article in there, and she encourages, encourages us to have a new thought. She says, every moment is an opportunity to experience life differently. Doing the same things in the same way demonstrates an attachment to how it's always been done. She says, it's time for a new thought, which reminds me of one of my favorite sayings, and it's in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not changed. Change goes back and forth. Transformation is permanent. Be transformed by thinking differently is what it's saying. I, I, I just love that. Robin states that we need to break through repetitive patterns. As the saying goes, if you want something you've never had, you've got to be willing to do something you've never done. The opportunity lies in catching even a glimpse of what's outside of our usual way of seeing, changing our view of what is to what is possible, not focusing on the problem, looking at the solution. So she gives this example where, where am I here? She says, oops, excuse me. She says we need to break through those, those patterns. And she talks about how if you want to go on a spiritual retreat and you need the money to do that, you can either focus on not having the money or what she says, envision yourself at the retreat. What are you doing there? See yourself making more money so that you can go to the retreat. What are you going to get out of the retreat and how are you going to act once you've been there and had that experience? So in NLP, we would see ourselves in spirit experiencing our heart's desire. Close your eyes and we would say, See yourself there, make it bigger, make it brighter. You actually see yourself in your own movie, that it's already done, which reminds me of another favorite quote in scripture in Mark 11, verse 24, believe that you have already received what you're asking for, that it's already done. Not that you will receive, but that you've already received it. Huge difference in how your mind looks at that. So believe that we've already received it. To me, that's, that's the one plus one equals two of manifestation. Finding a good feeling, good thought, seeing it how you want it to be, being grateful for it. So I went to an, an interfaith presentation at Mount Sinai Jewish Temple last month. And one of the questions that was asked to the interfaith group of Jews, Muslims, Christians, Baha'i, Hindus, and an amazing atheist that I met that day was, what do I want people to know about my belief system? Now, I've often thought that way about if you ask that to other folks, but nobody had ever asked that of me. And maybe it was the presentation that night or some other things that I heard, but I want people to know that spirituality is not a bad word. You know, I, I, I believe that each person should speak to source as they find it fit. Y'all have the, I, you've seen that t-shirt that I wear. May the God of your choice bless you. I want to honor you where you are in your journey. And spirituality helps me get that way. But part of that interfaith presentation that night highlighted statistics showing fewer and fewer people attending religious services. It talked about the nuns, not the ones with the big habit, but the non-affiliated. They don't affiliate with any, any religious affiliation. And I think it's because people are tired of being judged. And, um, you know, it's plain to see that there's a disconnect between the love and the joy that's spoken from the pulpit and the love and the joy that's practiced by the practitioners day to day during the rest of the week. I mean, even for me, you all know whether I've been meditating or not when you honk at me, whether I wave at you with five fingers or less than five fingers. You know real quick if, I've, if I'm prayed up so that when I get upset out there and I'm challenged, well, where am I? You know, you squeeze that lemon, what do you get? Lemon juice. Well, you squeeze me, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> so I, I work on stilling myself. But, you know, many of these folks talk about having the feeling of anger or not being honored where they are. I know how that's how my family felt when they were kicked out of the Church of Christ. You know, while difficult at the time, I am so grateful that they got kicked out. 
because it gave my mom and my sisters an opportunity to say, well, we've never done it this way, but let's go try something new. Thank God. And, and the people at the Church of Christ, they weren't wrong for the way they think. I honor the way they think. And I'm so glad that they let us know how they think because it gave us the opportunity to do something different or I wouldn't be here. So very, very grateful. Everybody can find their, their own way. So did, did anybody watch the Super Bowl? The, the only game I watched all year, every play. I thought, I thought it was a wonderful game. I didn't have a team in it. I just wanted a good game, and boy, did I get it. Remember a couple of the commercials that were in the game? I read, an, I read an article the week after the game, and it's about the He Gets Us Super Bowl ad. And it talked about how some evangelical Christians complained about the ad for suggesting that Jesus would even show love or compassion to abortionists, refugees, gay people, or anybody they didn't align with. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, the article stated um, the ad itself, or at least the message, is wonderful which is, Jesus loves all the people you hate, and he wants you to love them too. I thought, okay. But the article suggests that they're encouraging you to go to an evangelical church. And I didn't get that. I just thought, I, I, I thought it was wonderful. I just thought, hey, it's just a reminder to be more loving and kind instead of judgmental and mean. But, you know, of course, atheists and non-believers and other people of other faiths, they already know the great thing about Jesus, that he's love, compassion, grace, all, all those wonderful things. But ask them what they think about evangelical Christianity, and they want nothing to do with it. Why? Because they say, they, they say that those Christians are nothing like Jesus. And then I had no idea. I've seen lots of Gandhi quotes. I hadn't seen this one. He says, I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. <laughs> I believe the people leaving the church love Jesus. They just wish that the church that bears his name actually cared for the refugee, the poor, the gay couple, the trans person, the girl that had an abortion, the immigrants on the border, like Jesus does in that Super Bowl ad. Now contrast that article to one that's in the Science of Mind magazine this month by uh, Josh Reeves. He talks about relevant spirituality in the 21st century. Now I'm quoting him here. He says, people share with me the idea, the data all the time, that churches are going under and uh, new generations care less, couldn't care less about religion. And he says, now I admit that I thought I'd have my Walkman CD player and iPod forever. <laughs> but of course, that's not how things turned out. Well, I don't have a my eight track or my cassette player either anymore. He says, it's not the music that died. It's the mediums that evolved. He says, gatherings to honor what is sacred in life and to live a more abundant life because of that awareness is the work of our ministry. The longing in the souls of human beings for the sacred has not gone away. What's gone away of the dirt bird is the Walkman, the eight track, the cassette, even the iPod. You know, everybody streams music now. He's from Mile High Church up in Denver, and he said five years ago, you simply counted the people in attendance here, and that's how you could tell whether you were doing well or not. But he says now, hello, sweetheart, my love watching from, from Florida, now you've got Zoom. You've got the Zoom the day of. You've got everybody that watches afterwards. You've got people that listen to it on a podcast, so you have to look at things differently. You know, I've never been a real big fan of this. I thought it was okay during COVID, and then I started to see it more as a, as a crutch, and I know I'm wrong, or my beautiful friend Edie wouldn't have been able to watch me last December. You know, this is a great thing. And I also think when you're given the opportunity, if you can be here, sometimes the only physical touch that people get is here, hugging each other. You know, that's important. But I'm, I'm very grateful for the technology. He says our centers for spiritual living are not our places of worship. He says our centers are our people, the ones that tune in for our ministries. I think some guy named Jesus said something real similar to that. You know? He says just because your congregants, congregants hair is all gray doesn't mean you're dying. But you're dying if your message, message is for only people with gray hair. People long to move from bias to belonging, 
Our teaching has the unique ability to point out that it is not our job to tell people how to think about gun rights, abortion, or political candidates. We teach people how to listen and communicate respectfully and courageously. How else would we ever become clear on solutions to the problems of our day? We must build trust and listen, not divide and blame. This way we can help people think with clarity and not with bias. We can uplift with our philosophy without the need to put others down. And whether we've never done it that way or we've always done it that way, it's certainly how we need to do it by my map of the world. I'll leave you with a quote from Maya Angelou. She says, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you. Namaste. He left me with the big book. Oh, <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, and we are so grateful also that you took a different path because our roof wouldn't be the same without his roofing company <clears throat> after we had the hail damage. <laughs> There's a lot of things. You would have thought you were at the conference. So uh, I think part of the reason the magazine might have gone out late is everybody was down in South Carolina. Who knows? But uh, lots more on this topic. Perfect way to send us off for this month. Thank you so much. Let's thank him again. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to think about, and a lot just keeps percolating. So let's go within. Practitioners, if you'd like to stand, you may surround this room. <sighs> just breathe into that space the way that we've never done it before, the way we've always done it, the main thing going within to that space of spirit, God itself, that has already seen and been a part of the manifestation that is right here, right now, as us and as everything we're experiencing. And so we know we tap into that source for whatever it is we need to know in this moment as we step into the next moment and the next and the next. And so I'm grateful for this reminder for the questions that come up from these interesting topics that are presented to us each month and for the ways that we get to percolate them, look at them and see how it is we might do things different and what still serves us. I know that as we do this process, we step more fully into that which is spirit expressing in and through us leaving behind what is no longer working and stepping courageously into the new and the different. And so I give thanks for this morning, for the message from Reverend Bram, and for everyone who's present here and who is listening virtually and even later in the future. I give great thanks for this time, this space, and this opportunity to be who we are in this moment and in this day and time. And I just release these words. Know that we are blessed, and so it is. Thank you. Well, like I said earlier, this song is also about change or transformation, and um, uh, I really like the words. I'm, I'm going to try to enunciate so so you can share them with me. But um, uh, something about you know, r rather than reacting to problems, to um, start from a, a position of I am in the divine, um, and then and then let let transformation arise from that. That's what I'm getting out of this. So it's called When My Moment Comes, and it's by Sue Riley. I stand alone. I close my eyes and wait. Against the wind, steady and strong, I am unmoved, for I am not afraid. I stand and wait, for I know how to wait. I'm holding on. For when my moment comes, when my moment comes, like the phoenix, I'll arise.
rise when it comes beneath this veil of whom I seem to be truth is the stuff I lean upon I come to claim what has been promised me and give my heart that was a broken heart a brand new dawn for when my moment comes when my moment comes like the phoenix i'll arise when it comes i can see upon my heart my sacred destiny a brand new start for when my moment comes when my moment comes like the phoenix i'll arise when it comes like the phoenix i'll arise when it comes thank you and thank you for being here and thank you again, uh, Reverend Bram, for your perfect message for this morning. And now is the time that we consider and think about how it is that we support this center. And as we know, there are so many different ways and things going on. And uh, it's amazing who might be listening, who's out there. I'll tell you more about that next week, too. So just consider how important it is that this space is here to gather in, to be here in person, as well as to create these videos and send them out there to the world. So consider giving back to the center and helping us to keep these doors open and keep this activity going. And 10% of all that comes through these doors goes out to support some other entity within our community. And this month, it is the mission of Children's Reading Alliance. And their goal is to engage families in the community to promote children's literacy. And there's the logo up there. There's more about them in the newsletter. But we like to see that flow continue. And so we tithe 10% of all that comes in out to there. There are collection plates for on the way out. We're not passing them yet. <laughs> and, you know, we, we laugh when we think, well, COVID's over. Well, unfortunately, right at the end of the conference, we were told someone had tested positive. And so I stayed away all week, but I'm fine. But there are, um, you know, it's still something we're dealing with, unfortunately. However, we, we choose to, something we're dealing with. So we'll leave the plates back there. We trust that we will gather as much as we need and as much as what we need to support this place and to offer more to others beyond here. So let's say our affirmation together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, in me. And we'll sing, I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful for all that I have. I am so blessed. I am so blessed, I am so grateful, I am so blessed. I am so blessed, I am so blessed, I am so grateful for all that I have. I am so blessed, I am so blessed, I am so so blessed. I am so grateful. I am so blessed. So I hope
hope you all feel blessed by today. Again, I just want to thank you for coming and sharing with us again. Yes, we do feel blessed by this message, all the good reminders. And so now let's stand and sing our closing song. Which one are we doing today, Sarah? Go out and shine. All right, go out and shine. <laughs> the way we've never done it before. <laughs> shiny week and do things the way you've never done it before. We'll see you next week. <laughs>